In scattered places of the West are these old buildings and temples, remains of a forgotten chapter of American history, decaying houses, stone fences, and weathered storefronts remind us that the Chinese were among the pioneer builders of the American West. Chinese communities once dotted the land in California, Oregon, Nevada, even in Deadwood, South Dakota, where two Chinese fire hose teams used to race on the 4th of July. For six generations, the Chinese in America have played a role in its historical development. Immigration is the settlement of people of one country in another. What were the causes for Chinese immigration to the United States? More than 95% of the early Chinese immigrants were Cantonese, meaning they came from Guangdong, a province in South China. Guangdong faces the South China Sea and has a long and colorful history of foreign contacts. For centuries, foreign merchants have traded at Canton, capital of Guangdong, and Chinese merchants have traveled far to Java, Malaya, Japan, and even India. But these were mainly business contacts. Few Chinese went overseas to work or to settle until the second half of the 19th century. There were many reasons why, during this period, more than two million Chinese left their homeland. China was an agricultural country. Most of the people depended on farming for their livelihood. As China's population grew over time, land became scarce. Although the number of people doubled from 1770 to 1840, the amount of farming land actually dropped. There were also periodic floods and droughts, which caused famines and uprooted millions of people. The 19th century was a period of increasing military and economic penetration of China by the Western nations, such as England, France, Russia, and the United States. In earlier years, Western merchants had traded peacefully with the Chinese at Canton. Demand was high in Europe and America for Chinese tea, silk, and porcelain. But there was little that the Chinese wanted to buy from the West. For example, to pay for Chinese goods, American traders of the 18th century sold to China mostly beaver skins and ginseng. Ginseng is a plant root used in China as a medicine. Ginseng root found wild in the Hudson River Valley was sold in China for upwards to $400 an ounce. But these prices soon dropped to $2 a pound. The Chinese market remained limited. Then foreign traders discovered that they could make large profits through the sale of opium, a narcotic drug. Opium quickly became the prime cargo of British and American ships bound for China. Many people became addicted. In addition, by 1830, Opium drained from China over 30 million ounces of silver each year and caused increased taxes and prices for the average Chinese farmer. To stop this harmful trade, Chinese officials burned opium in 1839. The result was a war with England, the first opium war. China was badly defeated. In the Treaty of Nanking, China had to accept British demands for increased trade, as well as special rights for the British in China. Other countries, such as the United States, soon also demanded similar rights. It was the start of a hundred years of foreign domination in China. These problems were not suffered in silence. Rebellions broke out in many parts of China. The Taiping Rebellion raged for 15 years. Over 20 million people were killed in what was probably the worst civil war in world history. Against this background of poverty and war, some Chinese look for opportunities abroad. But, as immigrants from a defeated nation, their treatment in other countries was very poor. China was being plundered by the colonial Western powers. Its people, likewise, were exploited as cheap labor. Many Chinese went abroad as coolies. Coolie is an East Indian word for a manual labor.
It was used to describe the Chinese who worked overseas under slave-like conditions. The 19th century coolie trade was similar to the earlier African slave trade. Some coolies were tricked by false promises. Others were kidnapped and sold to greedy ship owners who took them to plantations wherever labor was needed, to Southeast Asia, South America, or the West Indies. Large numbers of Chinese first came to this country in the 1850s, a few years after gold was discovered in California. But the Chinese were not simply gold diggers. Immigration to this country was part of a worldwide pattern of Chinese emigration caused by poor conditions at home and the demand for labor elsewhere. Almost all the early Chinese immigrants were young men who had been recruited by labor contractors to meet the needs of American businessmen. But this immigration was not part of the coolie trade. These young men came mostly by way of the credit ticket system, where they were lent money for the voyage, which they paid back out of their earnings. They were free once the debt was paid, which usually took about three years. In the days of the gold rush, San Francisco was closer in travel time to Canton than to New York. Until the restriction of Chinese immigration in 1882, the Chinese made up roughly one-tenth of the population of California. Since all the Chinese were able-bodied men, their importance on the labor market was even greater. In 1870, one out of five workers in California was Chinese. Their role in the building of America is a story seldom told. What were the achievements of the early Chinese in this country? Like other 49ers, the first Chinese who came worked mostly in mining. Most hoped to make a small fortune and then return to their homeland. But this attitude was true for other miners as well. In reality, most of the Chinese did not find quick gold and stayed to work a lifetime. Driven from the richer claims and frequently attacked by other miners, they still stayed. By 1870, they made up one quarter of all gold miners in the state, representing the largest single ethnic group. As the gold fever died out, the Chinese worked in other fields. Much of the agriculture and industry of the West were started through the pioneering efforts of the Chinese. They were vital to the building of the first transcontinental railroad. The railroad had been planned for years, but nothing was done until 1861. Then the Civil War broke out. Now the railroad was needed to transport California gold to support the war effort. Unable to find enough white workers, the Central Pacific turned to the Chinese. Soon they made up 80% of the workforce. They did the hard and dangerous tasks of leveling roadbeds, and placing gunpowder to blast out mountainsides. They worked through two winter snowstorms in the Sierra Nevadas and laid tracks under the scorching sun in Nevada. In four years, they brought to reality an old American dream of a railroad from coast to coast. But even as a golden spike was being driven, they had already been forgotten. No Chinese face is seen in this picture. In agriculture, Chinese workers built dikes in the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta, transforming swamps into productive farmland. They used their skills in the farms of the Central Valley and built the vineyards of Napa and Sonoma County. Chinese fishing ships at one time could be seen from San Diego to San Francisco. In the Northwest, their labor helped start the salmon industry. In San Francisco, they built the first stone building in 1854. Each granite block had been shipped from China and reassembled. When the Civil War cut off the supply of Eastern manufactured goods, the Chinese made clothes, shoes, boots, and cigars. The Chinese in America have also contributed to the advancement of science and technology. Louis Gim Gong, who came here as a boy in 1872, worked for many years in Florida to develop new strains of oranges and other fruits. And although the Wright brothers flew the first airplane, 
It was a Chinese immigrant, Fang Zhou Gui, who brought the air age to the West Coast about six years later. He built his plane in an open garage and made the headlines with his flight on September 22, 1909. Despite the significance of these achievements, the early Chinese immigrants were severely hampered by the discrimination and prejudice which they faced. What do you think were the reasons for the anti-Chinese sentiment in the early West? The Chinese came as members of a weak, non-European nation. In contrast, the United States was a young, expanding country confident of her strength and manifest destiny. But this rousing national spirit carried with it widespread attitudes of racism against the non-white peoples. Like other minority groups, the Chinese found equal opportunities denied them because of their racial background. The first cases of discrimination were in the mining camps. There were frequent robberies and murders. However, the Chinese were denied legal protection. In 1854, a law which had prohibited blacks and Native Americans from testifying in court against a white person was also extended to them. The California courts also passed a foreign miners tax, levied first on the Mexicans and then on the Chinese. From 1850 to 1870, this tax took from them over $58 million half of California state revenue for those years. Ironically, it was the Chinese-built railroads that brought in large numbers of Easterners and European immigrants and intensified competition between Chinese and white workers. In the post-Civil War Depression, unemployed white workers blamed their difficulties on the Chinese. Easy to pick out by their physical differences, they were convenient scapegoats. In many western cities and towns, the Chinese were attacked and their houses burned by angry mobs. In Denver, Los Angeles, Portland, and other places, Chinatowns were destroyed and the people driven out. Labor organizations formed so-called anti-coolie associations and said, the Chinese must go. The Chinese were accused of flooding into the country, destroying its democratic institutions, and taking jobs away from white workers. We regard the presence of the Chinese in our midst as an unmixed evil, ruinous alike to the people and the state. It's not a question merely of morals, of social conditions, or of political economy. It is all these. The subversion of our American civilization is involved in this Chinese emigration. These charges were either untrue are greatly exaggerated. The Chinese often fought racist legal practices in the courts, thereby strengthening the civil rights for all Americans. Although called tools of businessmen for keeping wages low, they fought to better their working conditions. In 1867, 2,000 Chinese railroad workers went on strike to demand a 10-hour day and equal wages with white workers. The strike failed because they were not supported by other workers. In the end, they were starved out by the railroad owners. The anti-Chinese movement had created a myth of the Chinese threat. For many years afterwards, most Americans could see the Chinese only as foreign and threatening. For several generations, this myth influenced and shaped the lives and experiences of the Chinese in America. <laughs>